south side of Chicago, so close to here, and he joined the Carmelite Order in 1954 and was ordained in 1962. He spent 25 years in Chicago as a parish priest, community organizer, school principal, pastor, and director of the Provincial Commission of Justice and Peace. He obtained a master's degree in urban studies from here, Loyola University, and in 1989, he began a five-year assignment as Director of Formation in the Carmelite House of Studies in Washington, D.C. In 1994, he was pastor of St. Raphael Parish in South Central Los Angeles. And during this time, he grew to become strong. An and I would say, and a, I'd say, yeah, an expert and an, an articulate in the inner city uh, Catholic education. So he now lives in El Salvador, where the Carmelites have a strong presence, um, and he's the author of several books, of which I highly recommend. Um, you'll see them at the front desk. There's um, Been There All Along, which I re recommend. His most recent one is uh, Praying Our Way Into Life. And um, as a regional coordinator for Ontario and Northwest New York, um, I, I've been writing articles in our newsletter um, on a monthly basis. And our earlier newsletters, I used to write articles that would compare, like seeing the world through the secular eyes and seeing the world through the eyes of Carmelite spirituality. And it was from um, Father Tracy's book here, Pilgrimage to God, that became my source for information for that, that really enhanced looking at the world through Carmelite eyes, through the eyes of Carmel and Carmelite spirit. So I have a huge gratitude overflowing to God for Father Brian, uh, for Father uh, Tracy O'Sullivan, and please help me welcome Father Tracy Sullivan. Thank you. Thank you very okay. much. Sir. I got to go through the ritual here. There we go. <laughs> Obviously, I'm, I'm privileged to be here with you, but I must apologize that my Spanish is rather poor, but my English is fabulous if you can <laughs> stand a Chicago accent. So I'm here, my hometown, and ready to go. I have been. Uh, amazed sitting over there, the interconnectedness of the, of the speeches uh, uh, and my, my talk and the interconnected with one, one another. But especially, I, I have brought a lot of them in, into my talk, uh, my presentation here. And it's on contemplation, evangelization and contemplation. Two very big words, two words terribly misunderstood and I would like to see if I could work at getting all of us to understand them a little better. I want to start with a story about content contemplative experience. This is different than the state of being in contemplation. But all of us, all of us have contemplative experiences. And that's a, a special intervention of God in our life in a powerful way, with a great deal of love. So, and it was in this May 1973, I had a day from hell. It was uh, my last day of class to get that, that master's degree they talked about here at Loyola. I had to get a term paper done. I got up at 5 in the morning and worked until 8.30, took a cup of coffee, went over and taught. I was a, a very good language arts teacher, and I was principal in language arts for the 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. Had lunch, went back to work on my term paper, went to class, and thank you, Jesus, they let us out early, the last day of class. So I got home at 8 o'clock rather than 9.30. So I'm in my rec room watching TV, and some kids are making a, a real mess out in the, in the, there's a gangway we had between the rectory and the church. And usually I didn't have any problem with the, with the young people. I was pretty well connected, and I say, get out, and they'd get out. But this, this particular time, 
they were really rambunctious, throwing, and I didn't know what was going on, but all I cared about is having a nice drink and watching the White Sox. And so I went, I went over three or four times. They kept on doing this. So I made a decision that was very painful. I called the police. It was painful because being in, in the inner city in the 60s, my feelings about police ranged from bitter hostility to hatred. <laughs> and so I went to, I got, I, I was, I'll call the police. The police come, ring the bell, I go down, the kids are gone. They said, Father, you got a dead person in your gangway. I said, no, 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 I don't, no. So well, I'll come on and see. So we went out the front door in front of the rectory. The church is here, and there's this gangway with a set of stairs going down to the basement meeting room. And for all the world, there is this fella sitting halfway in the light, halfway out. Hollywood couldn't get a better lighting from what we had to discern. I opened the gate. There is this gentleman laying at the top of the steps. Looks like his brain's coming out over his face. It's all red. And we go over there. And as we got closer to him, there were two, two officers and myself, he started to move a little bit. And he said, what time is the meeting? And I said, oh, my God. He's coming for the AA meeting. <laughs> he was a drunk, and the red stuff was a jar of jam that the kids threw at him. <laughs> and uh, so I, oh, I said, I don't need any more of this. <laughs> One of the policemen went out to the squad and got a, a towel to start to wipe this man's face. And at that moment, I had a singular experience in my life. I saw Jesus. I, without, there is no doubt, there is no hesitation on my part. I saw Je the only time in my life I ever, ever had anything close to this, I saw Jesus. Later on, when I began to reflect about, upon it, I realized that I, I didn't know if Jesus was in the policeman or in the drunk. And it just came to me. Well, I immediately, I had a, a reaction. And my reaction was an awareness about myself, how pharisaical I was and have been on many things. The incipient beginning of, of self-knowledge, you know, Ernie Larkin, a great Carmelite scholar, described it this way. He says, young people are peaches on the outside, but prunes on the inside. And old people should be prunes on the outside and peaches on the inside. And I really was a prune. <laughs> I, I, had, I had it all going. Oh, I was working around the clock. Everybody idolized Father Tracy. But I was very selfish. I wasn't praying much. I wasn't praying very significantly. And this was a, a small step calling me back. The second thing that, that happened, slowly, I, I began to appreciate the situation of the police. And I transformed my, my awareness of, of their responsibility. But I got an interruption that really isn't an interruption, because it fits this whole story as it develops. The other day, I was talking to my assistant in, in our parish in El Salvador, and her daughter was there, a 19-year-old daughter. And the daughter is a very vivacious, exciting, bubbling person. And I asked her, I said, Cynthia, you're 19. She said, yeah, yes, yes. I said, what do you think about being 30? Is that really old? <laughs> and she said they, that, that the younger Salvadoranian women in particular, they speak with their face and their hands more than anything else. No, no, 
no, that's, that's not, no, that's, that's okay. I said, how about 35? <laughs> well, now, that, that's a bit of a problem. I, I, I don't know about that. And I said, what about 40? <laughs> that's one side. The other side, a few years back, my, my nephew said to my oldest sister, he said, Mom, in two weeks you're going to be 90. And she said, oh my God, I used to think that was old. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the whole point, the whole point is time really, really is ephemeral and, 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 and really hard to pin down, but it's relentless. It's relentless. So I had this experience in 1973. It was my past. The reality was that Jesus was with me all along because I didn't know it. But at that time, I was in the early stages of alcoholism. And alcoholism is a, di a, a disease that is progressive, insidious, and changes the way you think. So after a few years, I began to pray. And I had this tremendous conflict in my life of prayer and, 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 and drinking. And as it went, went on, the drinking got stronger and stronger. Finally, in 1983, I decided, I said, I'm not going to drink anymore. And by late 1984, I had stopped drinking 200 times. <laughs> And, and it just, oh, I'm not going to drink. Well, I'll have one today. And uh, uh, they have a phrase in AA, uh, one is too many and a hundred is never enough. And that's alcoholism. So I was self-absorbed, but I was praying. Eventually, the elephant in the room, which was my alcoholism, pushed me so far up to the wall, I could hardly breathe, and I had to say I'm a drunk. And when I did, I really found freedom. Took a while, but looking back, I didn't at that time, but I, a short time later, I began to see myself as the drunk with the jam on his face and Jesus coming to wipe it off. And my experience of that, you know, we have all these talks about mercy. This, this was so much of a merciful event. We live in the mercy of God, the sea of mercy of God. And, and, and so I experienced this. And, and I'm talking about this, the story of time, because these contemplative experiences are, are, are in a certain sense, are timeless. They're timeless. When we get into a state of contemplation, where we're in the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh mansion, uh, uh, that's, that's a different situation. But all of us have these contemplative encounters with God. And so this is 1984. In 1988, I went on a retreat at the New Mallory uh, Cistercian Monastery uh, in, in Iowa. And it was a just wonderful, wonderful healing, healing. The conclusion of, of this, this, this presence of Jesus wiping the face in a symbolic way, but deeper in my, my whole spirit, there was a healing going on. And I had a list of things that, that really just popped out at me. Boom, boom. This is what you got to do. This is what you got. And I came out of that retreat. Wow, I was excited and, and, and had a sense of freedom. Uh, dragging this 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 burden of, of being uh, uh, active alcoholic and then struggling to pull out that's a consuming job but now it's I had four years uh, of sobriety and and I go to this retreat and and I get all this thing now we'll go well, I'll come to it later but I chose not to go to AA I chose to say if I'm authentic to my Carmelite life my vows I'll, 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 I'll have the same thing. And it was. It was. It was uh, probably better, in fact. But any anyway, rate, the, the, the point here is I had this list of things, the in energy to move ahead. It took me 20 years 
to implement them. I eventually got, got around to mo almost all of them. But I, 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 you're all excited and you're as a long distance from speaking about it than putting it in your heart. It's a long trip from the mouth to the heart to make it real. And so I took 20 years to do this and I was on this journey. All of along, all along this journey, I'm praying more. I'm praying more deeply. And finally in 2006, I'm on another retreat at the priest's retreat house in Los Angeles. I have another experience. None of the experiences were like the first one when I was visual. They, these are deeper spiritual experiences. That, and I just had this sense of God and, and, and uh, Exodus 19, verse 4, God taking us up at the verse is something like this. I'll take you up on eagle's wings and free you from your slavery and bring you to my presence. And, and uh, I just... So it's one thing to feel nice, but this was way down deep, way down, and just very liberating again. So finally, one last final experience in this journey, and I believe they're all one event, starting with the, the original encounter with Jesus. They're all one event. I, I wasn't aware of them because the event is timeless. God's presence is, is timeless in this contemplative experience. So... I had finished 20 years as a pastor, and I had accolades from everybody. The cardinal said, you couldn't have done better, Tracy. You were really wonderful. Oh, my God, it was so good. And then I had done the school. It was a wreck when I got there. I built it up to be a model inner city school. I raised millions of dollars for it. I got programs on liturgy. I got a great Bible class. I got... Uh, all the other tough stuff. You know, an old priest told me, he said, Tracy, keep your eye on the ball. When you're a priest, you got to hatch him, match him, and dispatch him. <laughs> it's a good way of saying something, something very profound. And the, prof uh, the profoundness is the hatching is life. It's the, it's, the, it's the bringing of life, but it, we, uh, we could very, and we should, uh, as priests, we should begin to draw in the sense of the, the whole environmental uh, uh, message of uh, Laudate Si in, in the life among us. The second one is matchum is love, the relationships, whatever, all the relationships, primarily in the family, but uh, exploding in all dimensions. And finally, the, the priest has to work with the whole process of death and dying. And so it's, it's life, love, and death. I have my list of how good a pastor I was. And I was. There's no, there's no getting around it. And uh, <laughs> one day I was in my last, my, my, one of my last days there, and one of the... Uh, uh, Hispanic lady, ladies, as I was walking across the parking lot, pulled me over. Father, I want to tell you something. And she says, uh, you don't get it, do you? And I said, what, what do I get? She said, you, you, you have no idea. You have no idea how much these people love you. And that was another experience of contemplation. As I reflected on that invitation, the, the whole message was drawing me to John of the Cross in the twilight of, lo of life, the only thing that matters is love. I had my list of accomplishments, and Teresa says in, 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 in uh, Interior Castle, Chapter 3, uh, Third Mansion, she says, Sister, sister, put away your works, put away your works, and move on. And... That was my message from, from the, the lady that you know, all the works in the end, it's all about love. It's all about love, and we, we need to keep that focus in, in there. So, so from, the, from my, my prune and peach stage, uh, moving on, it's, 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 this is what contemplation is. It's the transformation through love. It's the transformation through love. 
So now I, I want to read some stuff that uh, it's my paper. Okay, so as a young priest in 1964, the light is terrible here. I'm going to see if I can. Okay. As a young priest in 1964, I was assigned uh, to the Woodlawn area in the south side of Chicago, a mile from where I grew up. In the previous five years, the neighborhood had transitioned from white to African American. For several years at this time, uh, it was one of the most overcrowded communities in the history of Chicago. One of, the mo uh, one of my resp first responsibilities was a catechism class for converts. It was quite successful. However, after several months, as I became immersed in the gross injustice of the overcrowding and segregation and the raw racism of the city, I felt frustrated and furious. I asked myself, is my work simply to pass on Southside Irish tribal customs amid this incredible human suffering and degradation? That question was very powerful. In one way or another, this question, drenched in the brashness of the 60s, was to be fundamental to my ministry for the next several decades. There were two men, uh, dimensions involved in the question. First, the relationship of the gospel and culture. And secondly, the integration of the personal and social, which Father Bugger uh, drew out so clearly and powerfully for us yesterday. These were two dominant issues in the development of the post-Vatican Church. I had a great run over 30 years as an associate pastor, social activist, teacher and principal, pastor and director of formation. Theological clarity and intelligent pastoral planning and program, programming arrived late for me. Most of my activity was driven by a burning enthusiasm for justice wrapped up in more bewilderment and confusion than clarity. Of course, that the, uh, this awareness is in retrospect. At the time, I never had a doubt, never had a doubt. I was right, and we moved right along. In 1989, I encountered Paul VI Evangelii Nuziandi, the Magna Carta of Evangelization. It was a moment of grace and enlightenment. It satisfied the longing that I had in my heart. I wanted to move beyond the issues and programs, the new fads, the progressive agendas. I was growing in an honest evaluation of my life and work, and I brought a life of rich experience and searching. It called me to a more humble and deeper spirituality. Twelve years earlier, at the end of a sabbatical year in 1977 at Notre Dame, a question uh, typical of a 42-year-old was, and then the question I had, what am I going to be when I grow up? <laughs> I responded, a Carmelite. <laughs> now, 12 years into the search, I was beginning to handle, get a handle on this ideal. Almost two decades after the beginning uh, uh, encounter with Evangelii Nuziandi, a parish Bible class led to a discovery of Teresa, as a real pastoral powerful force and I began to see contemplation as totally desirable goal for all. We talk about contemplation for the Carmelites, it's for everybody. It's for everybody. We should be leading the way, but contemplation is for everybody. So this is now part two. The search to integrate evangelization and contemplation. The struggle to integrate evangelization and contemplation has been a lifelong adventure for me. I hope to share the fruits with you. I had a, a hunger in my heart for something more. Slowly, over the years, this hunger gave way to an evolving clarity. Eventually, I encountered uh, the message of evangelization. I was 27 years ordained when I began to grasp the depth and the breadth and the unifying potential of this fundamental task of the church. For most of my life, I was 
uh, I saw contemplation as some esoteric goal for a handful of chosen, totally irrelevant, irrelevant to my quest for the gospel. Only late in life have I discovered its incredible creative power for both ministry and my search for God. I want to uh, present two statements uh, for your reflection. I hope you can uh, see the stunning depth and breadth of evangelization. At the same time, we must remember that contemplation in the, in the Carmelite tradition is a new kind of presence of God with spiritual affection and an infusion of loving knowledge. It is a purifying and transforming presence. We got it. Okay. So here we have evangelization. The church evangelizes. When she seeks to convert solely through the divine power of the, of the message, she proclaims both the personal and collective consciousness of people, the activities in which they engage, and the lives and concrete milieu which is theirs. Now that last section, the lives and concrete milieu, that covers the whole social, ecological, and, and, and economics, and, and pol politics, and all the rest. All of reality is to be evangelized by Jesus Christ. And, and in our statement, this is the fundamental statement of the church about evangelization. It's this, through the power of the proclamation of the word, what we talked about so, uh, so much in different talks of this encounter with Jesus. It's, it's, it's there, not just me and Jesus. It's all of us in Jesus, all reality in Jesus. And that's, that's the good news. So Cardinal Bernadine uh, uh, had this to say about evangelize. To evangelize is, is to touch someone's heart. Uh, and uh, do I have that up there? No. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, to evangelize is to touch someone's heart and mind and imagination with the risen Lord. The encounter becomes so significant that the person begins to reinterpret and redirect his or her whole life around Jesus. To evangelize is to help another person pay attention to, celebrate, and live in terms of the living God revealed fully by Jesus and present in our human experience. I would say uh, the questions we had about youth, that this is, this is where we start. This is where we start. We've got to get give Jesus to them. We got to get the message there. We got to let them encounter Jesus and, and cut through, as uh, Matt Malone said, cut through the stuff. It's about a person. It's not about the book, the doctrine. You got to do this. You got to do that. Uh, so so uh, I, I just need to interrupt because it's so you're, you're talking and you get going. I got to tell you one little story here about Jesus. I was saying mass for the, uh, we have 300 kids in our school and we had the mass every week. And, and this was maybe 10, 12 years ago when, when cell, uh, the cell phones, you know, the, they, they were popular, but they weren't anything like they are now. But, but they were just coming into the school and we said, no, nobody can have a cell phone. Nobody can. And so I'm saying mass and my cell phone goes off. <laughs> so I'm cool and I say, hello. How are you? Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll be glad to do that. Okay, thank you. I said, that was a call from Jesus. And, <laughs> and he just wanted to tell you that he loves you and that he really, really wants you to be good and do your work at school. About a month later, one little first grader came up to me and said, Father Tracy, I got a problem. And I said, uh, Peter, what's your problem? So, said, well, well, do you have Jesus' phone number? <laughs> so, we got to get him where we can get him. <laughs> one, other, one other small little aside is I, I learned to preach uh, in the uh, black community. And I... I expected interaction with people, with the amens, and yeah, go, go for it. And then I started in Spanish, and my Spanish to this day is very poor. But, but I'm good at, at, at uh, 
getting excited about what I'm doing. So I finish all my, my uh, homilies, inviting the people. I lead up, I crescendo up to a, a, a point about Jesus and, and said, now here's the question. Do you want to walk with Jesus? And they, I teach them how to do it. Say, as they go, see, no, I said, no, no, I just told you about Jesus. And you give me, see, no, no, no. Si, senor. Ah, okay. Si, senor. Okay. Now, now, let's get excited about it. This is, the, this is our God of love. And, oh, okay, now, do you want to walk with Jesus? Si, senor. Let's try it here once, okay? Do you want to walk with, well, this time we say, yes, Lord. Okay, you're all in. Uh, okay. Do you want to walk with Jesus? Yes, Lord. See, you're not ready at all. You're not. Uh, uh, about, about half of you didn't move. Uh, so, so you're not ready, but you'll get there. You'll get there. Okay. Well, one, one little point on, one little point on, on this, this final statement on Bernadine. Bernadine, this is very rich, beautiful. But he misses completely the whole social dimension. The social dimension uh, that's very clearly stated in the, in the fundamental statement of the church. And all of us, all of us, it's very difficult. I was listening to Father Don preach, uh, talk, give the talk yesterday. I have a lifetime of working with people on justice and peace. I know how difficult it is to avoid a privatized spirituality and a spiritualized spirituality and an eschatologized spirituality. It's hard. And, and when you want to work with the poor, where, where are you going to find them? You know, and, and how you work with the poor from where you're at is, is a very, very difficult task that, that uh, demands creativity. Because you're not all going to Salvador. You're, you know, I mean, you've got a few uh, responsibilities on the side at home, I think. But, but how, in your context, how do, you, how do you bring in that social dimension? So this, this, this is the start of it, okay? Now... Contemplation, and I, I watch this. They said it works. They say, Father Tracy, all you need to do is scroll. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Welcome to the 20th century where I live and technology. <laughs> okay, but on contemplation, let me read the let me read the. Uh, uh, points on contemplation. The 1995 constitutions of the Carmelites of the Ancient Observance uh, describe contemplation in this way. Contemplation is the transforming experience of, overpower of the overpowering love of God. This love empties us of our limited and imperfect human ways of thinking, of loving, and of behaving, transforming them into divine ways. Let me read it over again since it's not there. <laughs> Contemplation is the transforming experience of the overpowering love of God. This love empties us of our uh, limited and imperfect human ways of thinking, of loving and behaving, transforming them into the divine ways. Okay? Father Joseph Chalmers, a former general of our, our uh, order, said contemplation means... To grow in intimacy with Jesus Christ, surrendering ourselves completely to him. Gradually, he purifies us and transforms us, and we begin to see as God sees and love as God loves. Our journey, uh, on this journey, we must be prepared to let the lesser gods die so that we can receive the true God. We will not be able to uh, let the lesser uh, loves die. Uh, go unless we have known a deeper love. So they are connected, evangelization and, and contemplation. But there's a bridge, and that's, what I, uh, that's really what I'm, I, my message today, is that bridge between the evangelization and contemplation. So part three, I want to just give a... Receptive. Oh, okay. That's, that's, that's okay. Well, let's keep it at number three. For, okay. 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 I'll stay here. The... the uh, uh, the joy of the gospel, and this I just want to, everything I've got in here has already been quoted by the other speakers, but uh, this, is, this gives a little coherence to my talk. 
Francis wrote the, uh, the exhortation uh, in his response to the Synod uh, of the New Evangelization in 2012. So the joy of the gospel is a response to the Synod on, on evangelization. The major theme Francis uh, uh, had was evangelization. And he said, it's a message offering comfort and the attraction of God's love and, all, uh, and no, matter, uh, no matter their faults and failings of the individual. Francis points out the obstacles uh, 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 in the social and economic reality of the world when uh, we seek to evangelize. The globalization of indifference uh, flows from a lifestyle forgetful of others. The worship of, uh, he, and this is quoting Francis, the worship of ancient golden calf has returned in a new and ruthless guise in the idolatry of money and the dictatorship of a, an impersonal economy uh, lacking true, true human purpose. Consumption often has been grossly disconnected from the individual's human dignity. Now, I had uh, experienced as a young priest entering into the, this, this point of that the economy is really related to the whole encounter with God and, and, and the expression of our human dignity. And it, I started this, this uh, journey into social awareness of, of the economy and, and really a movement toward social, uh, social uh, justice and peace with the bro broken bottles. The broken bottles were all over the place and, and these uh, young kids would boom, they'd break that bottle and then they'd get and look for another one. I said, my God, you're gonna ride your bike and it's gonna go over the glass and you get a flat tire. And they looked at me like I was from Mars. I didn't understand. Boom, they thought another bottle is broken. The next four summers, we had riots every summer. And about five years after that, they wrote a book on black rage. So these little kids, they knew what they were doing. They were expressing their response to their reality, the dehumanizing and the, uh, they, couldn't, they couldn't even begin to uh, uh, use the word degradation or uh, 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 segregation, but they know what the reality was. I'm getting the short end of the stick, and so boom goes the bottle. Uh, at the same time, there was a very progressive legislator trying to get a law passed in the Illinois Senate to have a deposit on bottles. It took 20 years for them to get around to putting a deposit on bottles. And in the meanwhile, the community was suffering the consequences of, of that decision that was very beneficial for the rich and very uh, a point of deprivation for the poor. In this area, which was just north, just south of the University of Chicago, and was overcrowded because the, the pattern of segregation in Chicago had a, 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 a small place where blacks live, and it slowly expanded over the decades, and it went block by block. It was a very ritualistic event. But when it came to the University of Chicago, and, and with a great influx uh, after the, uh, in the early 60s, the it leapfrogged into the neighborhood where I was, which was Woodlawn, and they protected the university. So it was tremendously overcrowded. There were eight times as many children at, when it was a black community as five years previous when it was a white community. It was almost triple the population for, for about four years. It probably was triple. And then, then it began to ease out. Uh, the the they built in one square mile, a little bit more than a square mile. They built five new schools. And the school closest to our rectory had about 4,000 students. And it was the last school in Chicago that went uh, 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 for, for many years in the black community had a double shift. So one shift of, of students went from 8 to 12, another shift from 12 to 4. And that was the last school to go off the double shift. Uh, Going around visiting and talking to people, I found out that, that a, 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 an apartment that was seven rooms when, when the whites were renting it had, had been broken down to two, three-room apartments and, and a shared bath. And 
when it was the seven, they paid 150, and and for the three rooms, the blacks paid 175, and uh, it just went on and on. And then the, the the most fundamental thing on the housing is there was a double market, and because they had such a scarcity of of places where the blacks could buy, and so many blacks wanted to buy, that was a great a great uh, rise in, in the price and the whites sold cheap and and the blacks uh, bought dear so it, it that was another aspect of it and then the, the food in the the, the uh, uh, stores was downgraded and and when it was white with much many 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 less people there were 90 doctors when one of the black they had 12 doctors and so they had to go to the emergency rooms. I was involved for two years when I was doing community organizing, fighting a particular hospital about the mistreatment of people. We're, we're talking about Obamacare and all. I was, I was involved in all those issues. I didn't have a clue what I was doing other than saying hey, we should treat the people better. And uh, eventually, eventually we, we, we made some progress on that. So in, in the uh, whole point of that, that, that Francis is making when he's talking about the economy being connected to evangelization that goes back to the definition of evangelization that we need to uh, evangelize the total reality the total reality has to has to move in that direction now if I'm gonna do this where am I at Line number four. yeah but uh, No, I'm, I'm I'm missing a page here. This, okay. Pretend like it's smooth, but it isn't. <laughs> the Francis says the challenge for today is not a, a, a dogmatic atheism. Uh, uh, this is uh, this number, four. Should, number four. Okay, that, it's up here. Yeah. Uh, uh, that is not dogmatic atheism, uh, but a meaningful and inviting uh, response to people's hunger for God. The return uh, to the sacred and the search for spirituality are growing uh, in interest. Unless people find in the church a spirituality which can offer healing and liberation and fill them with life and peace, while at the same time summoning them to fraternal communion and missionary fruitfulness, they will end up taken in by solutions which neither make them truly human nor give glory to God. Chapter 2 in, in uh, uh, Evangelii, uh, Agadium Evangelium, Evangelium uh, so has, has two relevant sections uh, for, for my talk. Uh, in the section, Yes to the New Relationships Bought by Christ, Francis delves more deeply into the gospel calling. Here we find an exciting possibility to share Carmelite spirituality. In the following section, No to Spiritual Worldliness, he presents a detailed list of problems right out of Teresa's third dwelling places. In these sections, numbers 87 to 97, we have a real opportunity of including the riches of evangelization and contemplation in our church's vision. Francis describes true openness to others as a mystical fraternity, a contemplative fraternity. Walking with Jesus and openness to others, uh, in, 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 in walking with Jesus, openness to others, membership in a faith community, service to others, and reconciliation are all part of a revolution of tenderness. That's a big part of Francis's message, a revolution of tenderness. Part four, Teresa, uh, the wisdom of Teresa. In the third dwelling places the interior, uh, of the interior castle, Teresa gives us a picture of a person uh, having arrived at a virtuous and stable place in life. They're, they're in a good situation. Uh, a moral conversion has produced meaningful uh, victories over the forces of evil. The great temptation in the third mansion place, however, is a false sense of having arrived. While real growth happens, the tension between God inviting us to move on and our sense of accomplishment that draws us into uh, to put down our roots, 
Teresa stresses the, the truly sad story of the rich young man, the only one who re rejected Jesus in, in, uh, 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 by a personal invitation from Jesus. This is the uh, problem of the third dwelling places. God's message is a call to pilgrimage, to move on. Most, of, uh, most often, our response is seeking a mortgage. We want to stay there. And uh, what makes this level so difficult is that our selfishness has gone underground, often taking the appearance of virtue. Self-knowledge is, is the key to progress. Spiritual growth comes from Teresa's program, which is the interaction of humility, detachment, and charity, and deep personal prayer. I'd like to stress this for a moment. These three points, virtues, humility, detachment, and charity, our Teresa's teaching is how, how do we quiet down the monkeys in our mind when we're praying, our distractions. We're going in all kinds of different directions. And her point is we've got to sort of center ourselves. Long before we had the word, that was what she was teaching. And the humility is simply uh, being aware of who I am in the face of God, as Francis says so clearly and so beautifully. I am a sinner. I am a sinner. And the more I can accept my creaturehood, my brokenness, my infidelity, my ambivalence. Yes, Lord. Maybe tomorrow. <laughs> I, I, we, 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 we live with this. So the humility is, is learning that truth about ourselves. The detachment is having relationships with all things and all creation in such a way that we use it to help it, help us, help it to bring us to God. That's, that's a, a good uh, awareness of detachment is, is, are these things, when I use this, is this bringing me closer to God? I doubt it. <laughs> is my car, my house, my clothing, whatever, is it bringing me closer to God or is it an obstacle? Am I gonna, am I gonna fade out if I, I don't have my my, I got a, one of my many addictions is I got an addiction to read the newspaper with breakfast. And, and um, if I don't have the newspaper, I get a little, you know, detox time. <laughs> uh, but we all have addictions. And detachment is, is surfacing those addictions, very small and very major. Detachment is, are these things bringing me closer to God? And finally, the big, the big one is charity, as my relationship with others drawing me closer to God? Is it, it drawing me into this mystery of love that is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? And so bringing those three into our life, Teresa's very, it's, we call it the program of Teresa, and, and she's very emphatic that this is, this is the foundation of prayer. When, when, we're, when we, we are organizing our life with this focus, this recollection, this sense of presence, we're, we're, bringing, we're bringing ourselves into a period where prayer is, obviously, we're never going to get rid of, at, 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 at all teaching, we'll never get rid of distractions, but this cools them down and lets us get more centered and, and working on that. So uh, that's, that's a, a very critical point. Okay. Now, what makes the, the third uh, dwelling place so, so difficult is uh, this combination of God calling us and our struggle to move on. And then our selfishness goes underground. Now, the third dwelling place is, in, is the residence of choice for most good parishioners. Any realistic pastoral plan needs to address this, this group. The tendency here is to reconfigure the gospel to be more a more comfortable fit. It's a do-over of Jesus in our image. The integration of evangelization and contemplation addresses this issue. Uh, my opinion is that most churches are, are very much taking the gospel 
and fitting it into their culture. The point I made early on of a bit different, the combination of the culture and the cult, the gospel and the culture, is we're entrenched in, in the cultural uh, experience, and we, we try to fit Jesus in. And to get Jesus in there, sometimes we, we really have to slice a little here, slice a little there. This whole chapter can go, and that chapter, and, and we make Jesus in our own image. And, and that's, the, that's the big sin, I think, uh, for many, many people working in religion. Teresa describes it this way. With, and this is the monster quote of them all. So let's, we got it up there? Yeah. Okay. With humility present, this state, the third dwelling places, is a most excellent one. If uh, humility is lacking, we will remain here our whole life with a thousand afflictions and miseries. For since we will not have abandoned ourselves, this state will be very laborious and burdensome. We shall be walking while weighed down with the mud of our human misery, which is not so, uh, not so with those who ascend to the remaining uh, rooms. The, uh, I can't over overemphasize the, the importance of this. We got to move on in, in, the, in the spiritual journey. If we lock down in the third mansion, which is very, almost universal, if we don't stay in the struggle, if we don't stay in the struggle to move forward, we may not get to the fourth mansion. We may well get to the, the, the union with God, whatever. But we got to stay in the struggle. But if we lock down and say, well, I'm happy here. I don't want to move on. Oh, that's bad news. That is bad news for all of us. And that's where we have the problems. Even we have sisters in the convent that don't love each other. Is that true? Wow. <laughs> I know we do have a lot of friars that don't love each other, and I know, I know in the parish, I have a saying about the parish. Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. And Tracy says after 50 years of working in, in the parish, wherever two or three are gathered in his name, somebody's messing somebody over. <laughs> and... That's, that's the reality. That's the pastor's job is to break up the fights and uh, uh, get, 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 and, oh, I think it happens with Lake Carmelites too, does it? Oh, I, okay. No, no, it doesn't. No, they do it. Oh, that's good. That's good to know. Now, what, what? Okay. Teresa's insight on, 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 on moving ahead is that any pastor, any leader that's trying to move the group forward in a spiritual manner, is walking through a, a, a field of landmines, little, little agendas. Because what happens when you do this, when you, 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 you settle down, you develop the power struggle. I am the founder. No, you cannot change what we're doing. That group of people should not be selling outside the church. That doesn't look good. Um, oh, this group of people, they always leave the kitchen dirty. And it, it goes on. I got a list. You got your own list. But, but it's, the, it's, the, it's the inner fighting in, in, in any group uh, that comes from this. It comes from this. That sense of, of not being a servant, but being one who's in control. The one who has the power the one who has the privilege, the one who has the prestige. And the game in the church becomes power, privilege, and prestige. Very sophisticated in the name of Jesus. Very sophisticated. But it's the same thing. It's, it's, uh, it's there. So what we need is that openness to struggle, to move on. I have a phrase I use all the time. The grace is in the struggle. It's not in the accomplishment. We, the, the, where, where we're going to find God is in that struggle. God will bring us to where we, he wants to bring us. But our grace is, is to stay open to that struggle, not to, not to live with that ambivalence of one day we're, we're, we're generous and the next day we're, we're bad-mouthing people, fighting for control, whatever. It's, that, that's, that's the struggle of, of uh, uh, the, the whole program of this uh, Getting mired in our getting mired in our selfishness. Okay, now 
Where am I at? Okay. The movement out of the third dwelling place is into the beginning of uh, is the beginning of contemplation, and when contemplation, uh, uh, while contemplation is always a gift, our faithfulness and generosity uh, make the gift more likely. I'm going way over. I didn't. What? It's okay. Just a few. Yeah, few okay. I, I, okay. <coughs> Evangelization, for part five, evangelization and contemplation come together. The bridge between evangelization and contemplation is the mature development of the sp spiritual life. So we have evangelization is the beginning, but there comes a point where you need to go to contemplation. This is the passage that what I call the contemplative switch into the fourth, man, uh, fourth dwelling places. The spiritual life is basically living the commandment of love. Each of us will need to overcome sin and death in the uh, loving footsteps of Jesus. Ernie Larkin uh, uh, says that Carmelite spirituality in our time explains the process. Today we see that mysticism, the action of God, and asceticism, our action, uh, are both present from the beginning. Our personal generosity is critical uh, to, the, uh, to progress. There is uh, a repeating and deepening interaction between uh, God's grace and uh, our effort uh, leading to the uh, spiritual maturity. The spiritual emptying and the encounter with God are repetitive and expanding throughout life. The new insight based on Carl Rahner's, uh, Carl Rahner's teaching on everyday mysticism uh, is, is based on Carl Rahner's everyday mysticism. Rahner sees the experience of God in mysticism present from the earliest, most minimal encounters of grace. Rahner's insight allows us to focus on the spiritual life as a unity. We need to see the spiritual growth <clears throat> in terms of process, development, and transition, but experience is the key. Experience is the key. The experience of God is the crown of our spiritual journey. It is present from the beginning. Mysticism is the heart of Christian spirituality. Despite the, the creative development, uh, the traditional Carmelite notion of infused contemplation has a significant role to play in the journey of purification and transformation leading to union with God. In Francis' personal testament of the joy of the gospel, uh, 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 there is a major item that is not expressed, this movement to contemplation. Teresa opens up this new horizon of the contemplative switch. Francis gives uh, a, a vivid picture of those in the third dwelling places. Okay. okay. Those who have fallen into the worldliness look on from above and afar. They reject the prophecy of their brothers and sisters. They discredit those who raise questions. They constantly point out the mistakes of others, and they are obsessed by appearances. This is a tremendous corruption disguised as good. We need to avoid it by making the church constantly go out from herself, keeping her mission focused on Jesus Christ, her commitment to the poor. God save us from the worldly church with its superficial spiritual and pastoral tramping, trappings. This uh, stifling worldliness can only be healed by breathing in the pure air of the Holy Spirit who frees us from self-centeredness cloaked in outward religiosity. Francis says to avoid the ugliness of spiritual worldliness, breathing the pure air of the Holy Spirit is what we need. Teresa's teaching strikes at the heart of the matter. She points out there comes a point in the human situation where human effort is not enough. We cannot breathe the Holy Spirit to the conclusion. The pull of selfishness is so deeply rooted that it makes, uh, 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 makes, that, uh, it makes no difference if it is the cardinals in the Vatican cloistered nuns in the convent, dedicated environmentalists or social activists, or the Knights of Columbus or Little League parents. We all run short. In the search for God, the human effort has its limits. Paul describes in Romans 7, 5, what I do, I do not understand. I do not do what I want, to want but I do what I hate. 
there is a point where only God can carry us forward in the transforming power of contemplation. This is, this, is the, this is the bridge between evangelization and contemplation. This is, in my humble opinion, is where our pastoral effort needs to, to understand that all people, all by Vatican II, by virtue of our baptism, are called to holiness. And holiness is to be one with God, and to be one with God is contemplation. So all people are called to contemplation. So the contemplative switch, moving from the third to the fourth dwelling places and forward, is where Francis' pastoral vision and Teresa's spiritual wisdom interact. We truly breathe the pure air of the Holy Spirit when we engage in the transforming prayer embedded in personal integrity flowing from humility, detachment, and charity. We await the Lord in poverty. When evangelization and contemplation come together, there is a movement toward the full development of honor's mysticism. There are consequences, and here's my suggestions for the consequences. And as my conclusion, I really blew the clock here, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> number one, Carmelite spirituality is called to a new pastoral relevance, to new horizons. It is challenged to get real, to cast off a spiritual isolation, to make its message significant to the people in the pews. I'll give you a ex br very brief example. We have several people that work with the nation program, spiritual directors, and so on. The pastor should be the one that leads those programs. The pastor has to have the vision to say, we're, we're called to holiness. These are good, pro they're fabulous programs, but they're off on the fringe. We got to bring them into the center. That, that's what I'm talking about, bringing Carmelite uh, spirituality to the, uh, to the pews. Number, number two, for Francis, his pastoral vision needs to face its limits. Contemplative prayer that opens the pathway to contemplation holds the way to progress. Contemplative prayer needs to become the norm, not the exception, of our pastoral practice. Number three, Carmelites are challenged to bring the social dimension into the experience. Teresa says a comfortable lifestyle and prayer are incompatible. Humility needs to include identifying with the poor, Taking the smell of the sheep, detachment requires to one to address the predicament of consumerism that blinds us to the environmental consequences and the denial of gospel values. Charity opens up new concerns for the poor and the circumstances that create and maintain their situation of injustice. Number four, Francis, the Church of Francis needs to emphasize the goal of holiness for all. This will involve emphasizing spirituality over religion. Priests should hear and accept Francis's call to be facilitators of holiness as an essential part of their job description. Priests need to face the challenge of contemplative prayer so they can teach it as an integral part of their ministry. Preparing and summoning people into the contemplative switch needs to become the mainstay of any authentic pastoral plan. If it does, deep personal prayer replaces the pastor's psychic needs as the real activity of the parish and the revolution is on. Speaking to the Synod and the new evangelization in 2012, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan uh, Williams, uh, spoke eloquently of evangelization and contemplation. He described the contemplation as the key to energize all aspects of spiritual life along with authentic response to dehumanizing, uh, the, econo uh, the dehumanizing economic system. He said, to put it boldly, Contemplation is the only ultimate answer to the unreal and insane world of our financial systems and our advertising culture and our chaotic, unexamined motions encourage us to uh, uh, inhabit. To learn contemplative practice is to learn what we need to, uh, so as to live truthfully and honestly and lovingly. It is deeply, a deeply revolutionary manner. And finally, in his book, uh, Christian meditation, Ernest Larkin said, it is my studied conviction that the method of contemplative prayer, Christian meditation, can renew Christian life in the 21st century. 
and I hope my small reflection here today on integrating anti evangelization and contemplation is a small step in that direction. Thank you.